This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. So I thought I'd show you where it is on the map. It is actually here, um, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, right? Uh, very small, but it is there. I can assure you that it is there. Uh, we're we're uh, r- just between Libya, Tunisia, and Sicily, as you can see. So those are the three countries most you know that have been most significant in, in our in our um, history and in our formation. Um, the geographical factors are very significant because the fact that we are an island has meant that a distinctive national um, culture has developed. At the same time, um, you know, we, we, we have always been a, a major crossroads in the in the in the Mediterranean. Um, so, you know, the the, the, the the position of Malta, in a way, uh, gives it an importance that the size would not really justify. Um, I want to go rather, I, I, I won't take you right through you know, the, the, the development of Morty's um, culture, because that would take too long, and I would like to focus um, on the more important uh, recent, uh, more recent colonial times. But um, uh, there was a time when Malta was Roman, um, there was a uh, time when Malta was a Byzantine city in the 6th century AD, right? This is after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and then, more important than, than either of these, is Arab Malta. Um, the Norman conquest, um, uh, the, the Arabs came to Malta in 870, and um, although the Norman conquest put an end to Arab domination as such in 1091, uh, the Arabs were only expelled from Malta in 1249. So that there are, in actual fact, 400 years of close contact. And one of the things that we notice in Malta is that 99% of place names recorded in the 14th, 15th centuries um, are Semitic, uh, indicating that, that the language spoken before Arabic, like Arabic itself, uh, was a Semitic language, probably a form of late Punic. And the Maltese language that is spoken now is derived from Arabic. And I, um, what is interesting about the Maltese language is that um, it is the only Semitic language that is actually written in Romance letters, as I will show you soon. Um, the, the, when the Normans came, more or less, um, the Norman conquest came midway through the 400 years of Arab, what we can call as the Arab period, um, we see that Malta was very much part of what was happening to, uh, in Sicily as well. From that time onwards, you know, we, we, um, our, our history has generally been shared uh, with that of Sicily, which is a large island of Italy, right? Um, in fact, our national colours were uh, supposed to have been given us by Count Roger of Sicily, uh, who is said to have torn off a segment of his own um, standard to give us our colours. These are our, uh, this is our national flag. In the top corner there, you can see the George Cross, which was awarded to Malta by, by, by King George um, for valour. You know, because we were, of, um, by the time of the Second World War, as I will show you, we were uh, we had been a British colony for some time, and we went through the struggle. Malta was 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 um, dreadfully blitzed, you know. I mean, more bombs fell on Malta than you know uh, fell anywhere else, probably. Now, this is here as a sample of of Maltese sighting, right? This is in fact about our national flag. Um, the words mean white as a lily, red as blood. You vanquish all enemies. You vanquish all affliction, 
you can see that they are written in uh, romance letters, that Mojiz is written in romance letters, and I'm going to read that now, just to give you a sample of what Mojiz sounds like. Baida Khaljiliu, Hamra Khaldem, Tirba Kuladu, Tirba Kulen. Anyone here who has uh, any knowledge of Arab would immediately understand every single word, because the Mojiz is in fact Arabic and um, using Arabic, picking out, that is, the words that are Arabic, which is about, um, today, I would say about 40% of the vocabulary, uh, we can, in fact, get by in most North African countries. Uh, we, we can get by with our language in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Algiers, in Morocco. All, all countries, uh, all these countries are very familiar, both in terms of their language and in terms of their culture. This is, in fact, um, uh, these words were written by uh, George Pisani, one of our poets. Um, so we have, by the time that we were conquered by the, by the, uh, the Sicilians, at the, time, at the time of King Roger of Sicily, uh, a distinct ethnic community, we have the re-establishment of Christianity, uh, re-establishment because we became Christian in Roman times when um, St. Paul was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Uh, whether we actually remained Christian throughout the centuries up to the re-establishment of Christianity in the 11th century or not is a very, very, very um, thorny question in Malta, something that people debate, that historians debate, because, of course, um, what, 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 what um, is in the balance is whether you can see Malta today as having always been a European country, or whether our European Europeanity is something of uh, a later establishment. I will not try to settle the question, of course. Um, but um, it is certain, however, that by the 11th century, um, we are um, Christian, we, are, we have a commune that is ready to speak up for the Maltese, we are highly developed, politically speaking, and there is the recognition of this Semitic dialect, the Maltese language, um, being spoken um, in a Latin Christian hinterland. You know, we're at the very limits of, of, of Christianity, at the very limits of Europe. Um, I won't need to go into detail about Spanish Malta. Um, what is perhaps more important is that after having been controlled, along with Sicily, um, by uh, the Aragonese, the, 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 the Aragonese Kingdom in Spain, uh, we were handed over to the Hospitaller Order of St. John in 1530. Um, the Hospitaller Order of St. John was, had been set up in the 11th century. Um, they became later on a, in order that is to, to look for, to look after those that became wounded during the famous Crusades, the Crusades, that is the Christian Crusades, to take the holy city of Jerusalem that had been lost, that is, to the, to the Arabs. Um, later they became a military order as well. Um, the Maltese people could not become knights. Only men from noble European families could be knights. Uh, they had a great deal of wealth and power, and the Malta that we know today has largely been constructed by these knights. You know, if you look at uh, the three cities, or the city of Valletta, which is a little bit later. Um, the marvelous fortifications, beautiful fortifications, um, very similar to what is found in Rhodes, where the Hospitaller Order of St. John, the Knights of St. John, um, were previously to coming to being given Malta. They had lost Rhodes, and they were given the Malta. Uh, Malta, in fact, was transformed through the presence of the Knights. Um, before the knights came to Malta, the islands were only very sparsely populated. The population was poor, lived in the fear of pirates. There was a time, in fact, when, when there, there was absolutely no population on the island of Gozo, right? Or the, you know, it was, it was completely without people. We have Malta as generally, you know, Malta and the smaller island of Gozo. Um, you know, at any moment, um, these um, pirates used to arrive to force the Maltese into um, a life of, of uh, force throwing on the galleys. 
whereas in eight, by 15, 1530, with the, with, the, with the arrival of the knights, the construction of the three cities that I will show you, you know, uh, on the harbor, basically what, 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 what was significant about Morta was the harbor. We are a harbor, both for the knights and for the, and for the British. Mm -hmm. uh, the importance of Malta lay in that it provided uh, a very good harbor. Um, so here, from 1530, the population grew into a large international community. The knights that came from various European countries, about seven, right, um, languages being spoken, French, well, um, Spanish, two, at least two forms of Spanish, uh, and so, you know, the, the, the ambitious construction projects, um, the, 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 the military and naval requirements set up a healthy economy capable of supporting a thriving population. So Malta started to thrive, really, with the arrival of the Knights. Um, and, of course, it was also at this point that Malta became uh, multilingual. Uh, when the Knights came to Malta, they, all, they were organized in different auberges, sort of like small hotels, some of which can still be found in the city of Valletta, according to the lands that they spoke. So we had um, three French languages, Provence, Auvergne, and France, and these dominated over the others, but the number of Italian-speaking knights also increased greatly because of the proximity uh, between Italy and Malta. Um, at this time also, the Christian tradition of the island um, was consolidated. The church played a very significant role in the Latinization of the Semitic dialect. Today, about 60% of the vocabulary is in fact um, of Latin, most, uh, mostly, Italian, uh, mostly Italian vocabulary. Uh, the church was in fact in favor of using the vernacular in the churches, you know, this Arabic Italian, right? Um, because it needed its message to be clear. And when a cleric who couldn't speak Maltese was appointed, could only, for example, speak Italian, um, the, the, the objections of the locals were heard. And in fact, there is in existence a, a dispensation by Pope Paul III in 1541, uh, which refers to the lingua africana spoken by the people at the time. Now, one of the things that I need to say about, about um, the Maltese language, despite the fact that about 60% of the vocabulary, right, um, the, 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 the nouns in particular, right, that are of Italian origin, um, Italians cannot really understand the language because the, 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 uh, the, the language as a whole is a Semitic language, the grammar system is Semitic, and although they can pick up words, um, it, it, it is, it is, it is um, not, 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 not understandable to Italians. So it is very different to, Ita to, 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 Ita to the Italian language. Mm. Um, the next event is the great siege of Morta, right? Um, when when uh, there was an attempt by the Sultan Suleiman uh, from Turkey, this is under the Turkish Empire, um, that sent a, a, a great fleet to, to drive out the knights, and with driving out the knights, they would also drive out Christianity. Now, the battle was very significant, not only for Malta, but for all of Europe, because this was to determine whether it would be Islam or Christianity, whether the East under the Ottoman Empire or the West or Western Europe that would dominate not just Malta but the Mediterranean Sea. Um, this is a map that is meant to show you um, Malta at the time of the Great Siege. The middle promontory there, right, is the still unbuilt Valletta, whereas the three cities are here: Vittoriosa, Senglea, and and Cospicua. Um, you know. Actually, the, the, these place names, Vittoriosa and uh, Senglia, both um, happen to be uh, Latinate, Senglia after the uh, Grand Master lesson, but generally speaking, place names in Malta are Arabic, as I said. Um, 
a great deal of ferocious fighting took place mostly in the Grand Harbor, as I showed you here, or the fighting, you can see the, the, the Ottoman Armada there, right? Um, uh, in between the, the, the fortresses of St. Michael, St. Angelo, and the still unbuilt Valletta. Uh, the, the knights were far outnumbered, but with the um, mortis, they managed to uh, vanquish the Turkish Armada. And in fact, that um, the, 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 the victory, um, <coughs> the fame of the split victory spread across Europe, and many European rulers um, gave money for the building of Valletta. Um, because it was felt that to have Malta built up as a fortress for Christianity, a fortress for Europe, would be a very of great benefit to Europe. So you know this, um, it would be a strong outpost for the whole of Europe. And you, as you can imagine, the Great Siege is something that is still very significant in the cultural memory of the Maltese. Now, Valletta, uh, which started to be built immediately after the Great Siege in the late 16th century, um, led to another great development. You know, there was a great deal of activity. About 4,000 new inhabitants poured into Malta. These spoke um, one or more Romance languages and dialects, Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, a few hundred or so who spoke Greek. So, for, so that, in fact, um, with the building of Valletta, we have also this cosmopolitan Malta dating from the 16th century. Um, also, this is also reflected in the language that developed um, at that time a great deal. Um, they had come from, to Valletta from various areas, you know, peasants that came into work in the harbour area. They spoke different dialects. Uh, there are still at least five recognizable dialects in Malta, right? Maltese dialects in Malta. They were in close contact with foreigners. They came to a formerly inhabited area, which was Valletta. So there was no real local variety that could influence their speech. And because of this, um, the Maltese mixed with foreigners and a new coin or a language spoken in common among speakers of different languages developed and gradually um, spread across the island. And then um, we have um, Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte, arriving in Malta by that time, by 1798, that is the end of practically of the 18th century. The knights were, had become poor, they were no longer in a position to keep Malta, and in fact um, the, the Hompesh very wisely decided to capitulate to the mighty French forces and we find that the order was expelled from Malta. Um, we also know that the Maltese had already a sense of their own very prestigious culture, and in fact, before, um, as you will see now, um, uh, the Maltese rose against French, the French, because Napoleon started ransacking the Maltese churches, um, our identity is very much influenced by the Christian, the Catholic Church. And in fact, it, uh, although they accepted uh, the French passively in, uh, initially, um, this passivity changed dramatically when the churches started being grandson, um, because Napoleon needed to finance his war in Egypt. And when the Medina uh, church, cathedral, started being stripped, the Maltese rose up, um, the, the, which uh, chased the French out of the villages, and we, we, um, they were they were they were they closed themselves in in Valletta, and um, you know they they capitulated eventually um, to the uh, British, right? Mm -hmm. Who happened to be in the Mediterranean. Uh, they didn't surrender to the Maltese; they surrendered to the British. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, it was the Maltese Concilio Popolare that actually requested the protection of the British. Right? The French surrendered to the, to, the, to the British, and the Concilio Popolare, that is the Maltese commune, 
proclaimed King Ferdinand of Naples, the lawful sovereign in Malta, and requested the protection of the king. And the British took control in the name of King Ferdinand in 1800. So, you know, the, the, the colonization was not a matter of conquest. It was a matter of an invitation uh, by the Maltese to come in and protect Maltese uh, autonomy. And in fact, we see this Maltese Declaration of Rights in 1802, whereby with the Maltese um, demand that the British will secure to us and to our descendants in perpetuity the blessings of freedom, the rights of just law under the protection and sovereignty of the king of a free people, His Majesty King, uh, this is George III, and who uh, Britain was bound to observe and keep inviolate the constitution that we have in Malta, which with the sanction and ratification of his, of his said British Royal Majesty shall be established by us, composing the General Congress elected by the people. At this time, Malta was regarded as an Italian city. You know that Italy did not exist either at this time. Uh, it was a number of separate kingdoms, but as a place, it was regarded as an Italian city. Alexander Ball, who was the British naval commander and became the, serf, the, fir the first governor of Malta, famously <laughs> observed, I believe La Valletta to be the most tranquil city in Italy, and I hope to see it again very soon. And even geography manuals published between 1802 and 1880 treated Malta and Gozo as like Italian islands under British rule, under British protection. Um, and then, uh, gradually, the British started trying to anglicize Malta, but this was very, very <coughs> difficult. It made very little progress in the military, where 2,000 Maltese soldiers continued to receive their orders in Italian, right? The British would give their orders in Italian up to 1840. They, they made no progress at all in the law courts, uh, where the language of the law was Italian. The written language of Malta was, generally speaking, Italian. Maltese writing, we now know, did exist, but it was, you know, something that was barely used. The language of the law courts was Italian. And in fact, the British in 1836 confirmed Italian as the language of all the legal documents in the colony. And we find then, from around this time, that um, anti-colonial sentiments in Malta tended to be articulated in the Italian language. These came from the professional elite, the doctors, especially the lawyers, who were very anti-British mm -hmm. in um, 1836, 1836 um, and on, uh, as they felt threatened by the continued attempts of the British to take the courts in hand through the imposition of English. There were also disgruntled merchants who had suffered, you know, because of, uh, the, because of the competition of British traders, uh, who also supported this uh, use of the Italian language in Malta. It was the language of education. A Royal Commission of Inquiry was sent in 1836, and this had to accept Italian as the language of education. The Maltese language is a corrupt dialect of the Arabic, which has never been used for literary purposes or even written in a uniform or stable manner. Right? The Italian may be deemed the literary or even the written language of the island from the end of the 15th century. The records of the Concilio Popolare were kept in Italian. The Italian with Latin is the law language of the island. And they continue to talk about every Maltese author that hasn't written in Latin has written in Italian, all very true. The accounts of the native merchants, many of which were engaged in business with Algeria, for example, with Tunisia, with Egypt, right? Uh, many of these managed to be um, men of business because they could um, communicate in the Arab language, but could also speak Italian and French, right? Mm -hmm. So, in short, the Italian is the language of the Maltese for all purposes but those of familiar conversation. In the family, people spoke Maltese to each other. Uh, in familiar conversation, people of education, as well as working people, speak in their native Arabic. 
Um, and so the decision is that the Italian language is far more useful to Maltese than any other language except in the native tongue. Um, of course, the, the, what was in question here was whether the language of instruction and the schools that were being constructed under the British should be Maltese or English. At this point in 1836, the decision was that the language of instruction, at least in the, from the third year right, of, of primary school, should, be, should continue to be Italian. Um, and then other events started happening in Italy. We have the unification of Italy, which was very important from around 1840, 1850, very significant for Malta, because these Italian insurgents fighting under Garibaldi um, poured, started pouring into Malta, literally, from 1840 to the 1860s. They were political refugees who came to Malta because there they, they enjoyed the protection of the British, right? That, that there was a, a, a great deal of harsh persecution of these uh, followers of Garibaldi who wanted to unify Italy. Um, and so we have this Italian influence in Maltese politics. Italians often became teachers, and they also set up printing presses, which they were not allowed to do in Italy. And so we have this emergence of an articulate political class of Maltese people whose inspiration, culture, and language was Italian. And the Maltese started making demands on the British government regarding the setting up of public education, regarding the grant granting of freedom of the press, um, and making them, you know, uh, with this backing of Italian culture and Italianity, so to speak. And then things took another different turn because by 1863, Garibaldi had um, unified large parts of Italy, but there were still the vast papal lands. And this is where we find um, affiliations changing. Because what happened is that there was a rift between the Italian Democrats and the Pope. Some Maltese sided with Garibaldi and his democratic ideas, but many, many more sided with the Pope and were horrified at the idea that the papal states should be annexed to, you know, un under, under Garibaldi. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, handouts that I gave you is an excerpt from uh, a novel by Petra Bianchi, and you can see there how the clergy are, in fact, um, uh, hoping to be involved in the setting up of schools and uh, promising to, 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 to um, boost the teaching of English, right? um, seeing that um, Italian was being used now against the church. Uh, and so um, we see that the British started to court the Catholic clergy, particularly the higher uh, echelons of the, of, the, of the clergy, you know, the, the bishops so on. And so the struggle between the Italian Democrats that were fighting to um, form the Italian nation and the Pope, you know, this, this, this rift between them, showed the British that Italian culture should not be identified with Catholicism. And now the British started looking towards Catholicism, ironically, as a force, whereas previously, you know, there were attempts to turn, make Malta Protestant. Now they started seeing the Catholic Church as a force that could be marshaled against the educated, articulate mm. political class that were making a strong case for democracy and for Malta's Italian character. And so we see that the higher clergy were courted by the British. The British put more energy into anglicizing Malta by, uh, by dislodging Italian culture and language. And the Catholic, Catholic religious communities from, from Britain were helped to establish schools in Malta with the aim of spreading the knowledge and the influence of the English language. And they were very, very successful in doing this. Mm -hmm. They set up private schools. Today, um, about 27% of all primary school children in Malta actually attend Catholic schools, originally set up by, by religious communities that came 
from England under the protection of the British. Uh, and the language of instruction in these schools is English, whereas the language of instruction in the other schools, in the 70% of state schools, continues to be more tits so far. But I will come to that in a minute. Um, in uh, 1878, we find that um, the attitude of the British now changes again, and uh, there is an attempt by the, by the British to help with installing more tits as the language of instruction in schools, right? Claiming that um, uh, that Maltese children spoke Maltese and were totally ignorant of Italian, which was not quite true either, right? So what Keenan, who is uh, who was the resident commissioner in Malta in 1878, uh, said was that the knowledge which the people cherished most was stored up in Maltese, right? Mm. The language of Malta, the markets is Maltese, right? It is the native language of all natives, that is all true, but, uh, and he, he claims that Maltese children have hard times at school because they have to contend with Italian and English, true only to a certain extent, uh, because the Maltese teachers teaching the younger children would of course make use of both, in, of both Maltese and Italian, right? Mm. The point that he wanted to make that it was that the education of children frequenting primary schools must be based upon the principle of teaching how to read their native Maltese language as correctly as English children of the junior classes are taught how to read English in an English national school. Mm -hmm. The sort of complete correspondence between the Maltese language and the English language. English children learn through English. Maltese children must learn through Maltese. Mm -hmm. But the British support for Maltese languages in state schools and for the Arabization of Maltese, the removal of Italian language, met with a lot of um, resentment. Right? Um, the Maltese, Malta's educated class, felt betrayed by this British educational policy, right? And we find that the majority of the elected members of Parliament at this stage um, started defending Italian as la lingua nazionale dei Maltesi, that is, Italian as Malta's national language. It was thus British educational reforms that fired anti-colonialism in Malta, creating political turmoil that continued to simmer over several decades. Mm -hmm. The emergence of the Labour Party, the support of the British for the Labour Party, um, Maltese was put forward as the national language in partnership with English, the abolition of Italian in public administration as a medium of instruction in the higher grades of primary school and that and in the law courts, the promotion um, from 1927, very aggressive promotion of English and Maltese, with English becoming a requirement for government posts, workers could not find employment at the dockyard unless they had a reasonable knowledge of English, Italian started being removed from, seat, from, from street signs. The education minister gave official support to the Maltesafi movement, which was supposed to purify the language from hectarian accretions. Now, the Arabization of the language pleased the British, but led to words, the use of words that were not really uh, known any longer. And this leads us to the language question, which was the crisis of the 1930s, on, you know, leading us to the Second World War. So uh, what the Commission had said was that English should be established in all schools. What the Commission did not say, right, is that the Maltese people favoured the teaching of English in schools, but they were appalled at the idea of teaching Maltese, which they felt they knew anyway, and which only seemed useful as a spoken language rather than as a written one. Mm. And it seemed to the Maltese that the British were only doing that in order to continue to keep the Maltese people out of the higher posts in the civil service. And you know, there was a total rejection of this. The Maltese 
were not keen either when they were told that they would be able to emigrate to the US, Canada and Australia. They were not at all keen on this and politicians fought for the right of the Maltese people to continue to emigrate to Egypt, Libya, Tunisia and Algeria as they had done for centuries and where their ability to speak Italian was so useful. And demonstrations were held in Malta, um, shouting Viva la lingua italiana, right? Mm -hmm. Viva la lingua italiana, la lingua nostra, our language, la lingua della nostra cultura, the language of our culture. Mm -hmm. The most passionate nationalist feelings were voiced in the Italian language. Now, the language question in Malta divided the people uh, and it raged on until the Second World War. Um, and it was only finally settled, only finally settled when the first fascists dropped, uh, the first fascist bombs were dropped on Malta in June 1940. The Second World War put an end to Maltese Italianity. And um, the English in Malta, post World War II, um, Maltese Italianity um, had been swept away. But what is significant here is that middle class parents now tended to speak English to their children to help them get on well as soon as they started school. Um, the teaching of Maltese continued to be seen as an unnecessary burden to students, although EU membership since 2004 has opened channels for the Maltese language, language that were not open before. So the, the um, validity of the vernacular, I'm, I'm, I'm going quickly now because I'm, I'm over my time, um, has been uh, argued very, 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 very significantly by, by uh, certain people. Uh, this Michel Ancon for example, insisted on the social need to cultivate the national language, which for him was Maltese. So that voice was also there and it was heard. This Duncan Saila is our national poet, right? Um, Maltese writing in English from the 19th century um, started um, being, you know, developing very, very well. Um, nationhood became a central theme in, in Maltese writing and the national character based in Christianity on heroic exploits against aggressors and on a passionate love for the vernacular is what characterizes Maltese writing in Maltese, right, um, from the 19th century. Um, Malta became independent in 1964, a republic in 1974. We find that Maltese literature flourish, flourishes but the status of Maltese in education remained unchanged. Um, Italianism um, was swept away, but it was now um, English that was given, that gave this aura of superiority, right? Um, we have um, work in Maltese linguistics, Giuseppe Aquilina, Oliver Frigieri, right? Um, who have uh, written a great deal about Malta and, and the Maltese language. Um, the post-war status of Italian is, you know, in Malta, Italian is still widely used. We have um, te television, easy access to Italian stations. Most Maltese people on the street today can speak Italian. It has lost its highbrow associations and it has a much broader footing through the media, every, you know, um, through, through television, radio, etc., etc. The European Union, as I said, um, has um, necessitated the translation of the EU official documents into Maltese, right? Maltese is recognized as an official language of the EU, and this has been of benefit not only to the scientific and legal aspect of the Maltese language, but also to its literary patrimony. And the last few years are beginning to see the translation of well of Maltese books into English. The status of Maltese today Today, both the Nationalist Party and the Labour Party, the two main parties in Malta, today agree that the language of instruction in schools should eventually become English throughout, not just in the private schools, but also in the, in the, in the government schools. Um, so nationhood in Malta 
is not necessarily predicated on an exclusive emphasis on the vernacular. This is what Father Peter Saracino Glott um, put forward as an idea in the 1960s. Um, nationhood emerge, can emerge when the people themselves decide the cultural conditions which will allow them to be what they want to be. The Maltese build on the traditions of the hospitalers and they often aim to adopt humanitarian roles. Malta was known as the nurse of the Mediterranean in the First World War. And this, uh, again, in the, in, 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 the, in the Crimean War, Maltese identity today, the Libyan Civil War in 2011, we see that we continue to play this uh, humanitarian role. The Maltese government set up facilities for the medical treatment of people evacuated from Libya on ships. Malta was used as a staging point for the evacuations of thousands, hundreds of thousands of foreign workers from Libya. Malta often seeks the role of mediators in the wider world. This is the role that Maltese have to play. And so the Maltese identity does not depend on an exclusive emphasis on the vernacular. Rather than remaining bound to a single language, the Maltese identity may be expressed by the conscious adoption of bilingualism or trilingualism by most of the citizens of the state. And that is, thank you very, very much.